All right, so before I get started, uh, there's going to be a Q&A thing at the end. So I've also included a link here if you want to throw up questions on there that you can upload on and like, we can discuss later on. Uh, OK, so thank you everyone for coming tonight. Uh, before I start off, can we get a little bit of show of hands to understand where people are coming from? So we already asked sort of who's in tech. So who's a founder uh, that's currently working on a startup here in Singapore? Uh, show of hands. Good, good, good number of you guys. Okay, how many of you guys are working at a startup but not a founder? Okay, good, good, good. Uh, and the rest, like, uh, how many of you guys are in tech in general or in a bigger company? Okay, good, very good mix. Uh, how many of you guys are working on products specifically? So whether you're an engineer, UX, product management, how many of you guys? Very good, very good. So definitely the right crowd, the right people to have in the room. Um, so a bit of an introduction. So my name is Yue. Uh, I have been in Singapore for the last year. Uh, moved back to Singapore about a year ago. Before that, a couple of things that I, I was doing. So I am, I guess, professionally an industrial engineer from the University of Toronto. Uh, after doing that, uh, I went to IBM to be a user researcher for about 16 months, uh, where it was really, you know, day and night, really doing a lot of user research, a lot of. Uh, you know, a lot of market validation, a lot of being out there with customers, learning about how people interacted with IBM technologies. Uh, I then moved over to Microsoft for two and a half years, being a PM at the developer division, where I got to um, learn really product management from scratch, uh, and also learn about a, a new audience, engineers, building tools for them, and uh, at the same time, really <coughs> up, um, sort of development uh, on the side. Uh, and I'm now working at a startup here called Trade Gecko. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. Uh, they're about a couple years old now, uh, sorry, we are a couple years old now, uh, about 80 people strong, uh, based out of Singapore, we're doing inventory management for small, medium-sized businesses. Uh, so currently, I'm the uh, growth lead at Trade Gecko, meaning I lead the product team that uh, has you know, a group of marketers, data analysts, uh, product people, uh, designers, to really drive our growth levers here at Trade Gecko. So today, what, what are we really going to talk about? Um, this talk is applicable for founders out here, people who are in products, people who are curious about products, and really it's geared towards um, really helping you understand what exactly uh, the PM world, the product world is all about. So we'll start off with talking about what product managers do. Uh, we'll talk about the differences between what a good PM and a bad PM looks like, uh, when you should hire for product, especially for the founders out there, um, whether it's today or a year from now, whether, um, you know, yeah, when, when to do that. Uh, how you go about hiring your first PM, and how do you scale your product team. So those are the five things that I'm going to cover. And at the end, we'll obviously do a bit of a Q&A. So if you have any questions that are sort of outside of the scope or want to dig a little bit more into, more than happy to take those. So on to the very important question of what do product managers do? Um, it's actually an interesting one because as you ask different product managers, they will tell you a slightly different variation uh, of what this does, of, of what they do. And uh, a very uh, prominent quote from one of the product leaders who I respect a lot, Marty Kagan, uh, behind every great product there is someone, usually behind the scenes, working tirelessly, that is playing this critical role. They usually have the title of product manager, but they may be a startup co-founder or the CEO. The title is not important, but the work that they do is. So this is to say that behind every successful product, there's somebody behind the scenes doing a bunch of something, which hopefully uh, I will help define in a couple of slides, uh, to bring success to that product. Um, and the key part of the end there, which I find really important, is that we're talking about product management, we're talking about product managers and what we do, but really it matters less about that, but the fact that you know, there are founders out there, there are CEOs out there, there are designers out there that are taking on a lot of these product management principles on a day-to-day -day job. Uh, and that's really what we want to talk about, about what it means to be a successful product manager and what are some key areas to look at as product managers to help bolster uh, and bring your product to success. Um, this is a, a, a good diagram by Martin Erickson about what product managers do. Uh, it's also a very overused diagram to show what product managers do. It sh sort of shows that product managers are live in the intersection between UX, technology, and business. Uh, he also makes a very strong caveat that product managers are not always strong 
in all pillars equally. They might have a very specific pillar that they're particularly strong at, but they sort of sit in between and sort of sit in the intersection of that. And if I were to summarize what this means, you know, by being at the intersection between UX tech and business, product managers determine the what uh, that gets built for whom and when. So they determine what exactly gets built for what kinds of customers solving what kinds of problem and when that gets done through, for example, roadmap. Um, and most, most importantly, a good product manager understands the why. why. Why are we building what we're building for that specific person and when? Um, if you don't understand the why, you'll never get to uh, the real reason for why you're working. And product managers get there by building a product roadmap that builds towards a product vision. So as a, as a founder, uh, as you start your startup, as you, as you sort of push towards uh, you know, your, your big vision, your product manager's role as a product manager, as a product person, your goal is to continuously build towards the vision over and over and over again in an iterative process. And that's what your roadmap is supposed to get you to. Um, so now that I've sort of described at a high level what product managers do, what I want to talk about are the pillars of product manager. So as my um, first manager at Microsoft uh, adequately sort of put together when I first joined, he was like, well, as, a, as uh, someone who's starting out in product management, you have some <coughs> skills. Uh, you know, you, for example, I came in with uh, some skills in UX, but not necessarily in a bunch of other pillars. So what it is as a product manager, because the, the role in, encompasses so many different aspects, really you're building your toolbox. It's a toolbox that you'll carry around in your career, and each one of these pillars uh, as you go along, you continuously add different tools to uh, that particular toolbox. So, this is by no means the uh, holy grail of <coughs> six pillars of product management, but it's what I believe are uh, the key aspects uh, that I personally care a lot about as a product manager. Uh, number one is user centricity. Number two is someone who is business centric. Number three is someone who makes data informed decisions. Uh, number, uh, number four is someone who is technology literate. Number five is someone who is, has cross-functional influence without authority. And finally, is a team lead. So let's go through each of these and uh, let's talk a bit about what that means. So user centricity, uh, arguably as you know, we interview product management candidates and uh, we sort of uh, assess whether or not they meet the baseline, user centricity is almost always the first thing that we test for. Um, your, a product manager needs to put the user front and center in every decision that they make. They are fundamentally the voice and the advocate for the user. So when push comes to shove and a business decision needs to get made about what gets built when, uh, and um, th when the customer is obviously not in the room when you're making these decisions, it's the product manager's duty to step up and say, no, I believe that we are solving this problem for this customer and here's why. Um, without that, your product will often lose focus. Without that, your, your product will, you will end up straying and building things for people that don't actually need it. Uh, that user centricity and that user focus make sure that at the end of the day, you are building something for someone and they, that they'll absolutely love it. So what are some key skills that are involved here? Uh, for example, user interviews being a very important one. It's a very humbling experience when you put, whether it's a paper prototype or a high fidelity prototype or your current product in front of a set of users and watch them without influencing them to use your product. It's a very humbling experience because you see their struggles, you see their pains, and you can see whether or not they're actually uh, achieving their desired outcome. Uh, and as a product manager, that's probably one of the things that you should be putting front and center uh, all the time to ensure that you are constantly getting that feedback loop about your product. Uh, customer development. So, you know, not putting sp a specific product in front of someone, but talking to a customer for half an hour or an hour to understand what does their day look like? What are their goals, their goals for the next 90 days? What are their goals for the next year? And how can your product, uh, whatever that may be, help them get there? What are their, what are their core desires? What do they, where do they want to be? Um, and really understanding that will help drive some where your product should be. Uh, and finally, it's you know, pulling all that together into doing things like persona development. Uh, one thing that we started doing in Trade Gecko is, for example, having an empty chair at design meetings and putting a customer name in front of it uh, because we want to ensure that whatever decision we make, we point to a specific customer and say that we're solving this problem for this specific customer. Uh, and that user centricity is really at the core of that. 
Um, some of it was business centric. That's one of the you know also very important pillars of product management. Um, products, in many ways, especially if you're a startup, is your business strategy. Uh, without products, there's nothing that you can go to the market with. So a, pro a good product manager doesn't just go into a hole and design beautiful things that you know some people say thumbs up to. They also have a very deep sense and a very deep understanding of how that ties into your business model. So whether you're a SaaS-based business, so let's say you're a SaaS-based business and you have a subscription model that has different plans, a product manager will, as they develop a feature, be able to break down and say, break down uh, the feature and say, you know what, we will break down this feature into three different uh, areas. You know, one is for people on the lowest tier, one is for people on the mid tier, and one is for people who are paying us the high tier. And they have a very good sense of how to monetize. They have a good sense of how to uh, get things out there. Um, and that's just the alignment between uh, product and strategy uh, that's just so, so core uh, for good product leaders. Uh, some important skills to have, for example, things like basic things like market sizing. Um, who, who's going to buy your stuff? Uh, if you're saying that um, you know, delivery, uh, you know, delivery of chocolate bars is your next business, how many people in Singapore are willing to buy that? Having a good understanding of your market. An ROI analysis. If I work on this feature, what is the expected return and expected value that I can expect out of that if the feature is done? Um, and go to market. You know, I can design um, and ship and create an app that does delivery of chocolate bars in Singapore, uh, but if I don't know how exactly to get this to the hands of users, what's, what's the point? So, um, a product manager needs to have some semblance of understanding of uh, business and how the product strategy ties into the business strategy. And for a startup, those two often go pretty much hand in hand. And this one's an interesting one, uh, oftentimes skewed the wrong way. So good product managers, I think most importantly, are highly analytical. Let's take that as part one. Uh, part two is that they often make very data-informed decisions. So you'll find a lot of product managers uh, you can skew, they, they often skew, they can often skew the other way where, you know, all they care about are numbers and all they, you know, they only make data driven decisions, but that's not the full story and I want to really emphasize that. Uh, product managers manage to pull, they, good product managers pull in qualitative and quantitative feedback and know when to sway one way versus the other and balance both of those two things out and back their intuition with customer interview feedback, with qualitative feedback that you know they've gathered from talking to a ton of users, and also quantitative feedback. So they're familiar with things like, if you look at the skills, things like A-B testing. Uh, they know what it means to test two ideas out and figure out which one's the winner and which one to execute on. Uh, they know how to use analytical tools. And you know, it doesn't really matter which one, uh, you know, but a uh, product manager knows how to pick up a tool like, for example, mixed panel and knows what it means for them, for, you know, for the product to have a funnel. The say the number of people who actually log into the product, the number of people who actually uh, perform a couple key actions, the number of people who actually buy, and building on that funnel, and understanding that. And uh, I, I can't emphasize this enough, uh, just as a general person, if you guys, especially those who are in startups, those of you who are in tech, uh, the most important skill that I've learned in my life <coughs> is SQL. Um, some people may disagree, but I actually think that it's my way of communicating with data. And if without understanding SQL, I wouldn't have been able to draw insights and uh, figure out patterns as effectively. So, um, as a product manager, once again, the, the analytical piece of being able to draw conclusions from data, both qualitative and quantitative, super important. Um, and there's some key skills that go along with that. Influence without authority. Um, I don't know how many actual people actually people here actually have product manager in their title, uh, but 90% probably more. A good most most of the product managers out there don't actually have anybody reporting to them. So you're here in a situation where product managers are expected to deliver, they're expected to ship, they're expected to push things out, they're expected to lead a team, but almost never have anybody reporting to them. Uh, so as you're hiring and looking at product management, either as a career or hiring a product manager, a good product manager can influence without authority. And that's one of the key uh, pillars uh, that I really took out, especially being a product manager working in a larger organization. You learn that as a product manager, you need to rely on everything in your toolbox to convince everyone around you that what you're working on is the most important thing and they should continue funding it. So whether you're talking to a stakeholder and support, or you're talking to executives, trying to get executive buy-in for an idea, 
or whether you're talking to your engineers, convincing them that this is the next, the most important thing to build. Um, and product managers are there to persuade others with data. They're there to persuade others with their analyses based on qualitative and quantitative feedback. And they're also very, very good storytellers. They can piece together stories from data, from customer interviews. They can really put a person behind a feature to really talk about who at the end of the day uh, will benefit from this and why. So being able to influence without authority is so, so important, especially as your organization grows. So what are some key skills related to that? Number one I put up there is empathy. Um, empathy is, as a product manager, probably one of those skills that you just need to continuously build out and continuously use uh, for different aspects. So empathy for your customer, part A, but also empathy for people you work with, right? So if, you're, if you understand, you know, as an, if you understand that your engineers are struggling, you know, with shipping a feature out. You understand that the support team is really swamped with tickets. Mm -hmm. If you understand that the marketing team is having trouble marketing your product, that empathy and the understanding of what people around you are struggling with is a very, very core uh, skill set as a product manager. There's a very core uh, human element to it as well that you generally can't influence people around you unless you really understand what they're going through and what they care about. So once again, empathy, uh, go get some. Relationships, building those relationships as you go. Uh, you find that product managers often don't, you know, they're often not at their seats at the office because they're, they're everywhere. They're talking to support, they're talking to sales, they're talking to marketing, they're, they're, they're working with, you know, their engineers on, on you know, wireframes and what's, you know, what, what's about to come out. Because they want to continuously build up those relationships. They recognize that without those bonds that they can create inside of the, their work organization, there's no way that they can continue influencing the team. Uh, and stakeholder management. Um, it is not a product manager's role, and I'll have a slide talking about that later, uh, not a product manager's role to just say yes to everything. A good product manager will question, a good product manager will know how to manage their stakeholders. Uh, bad product managers, for example, just say yes to whatever the sales team says you know, they should build next. A good product manager has a deep understanding and know when to push back and say, actually, we've talked to 50 customers and we know that they don't want a X, they want Y instead. Uh, technology literate. Uh, this one is a, you know, I put this slide up because I think, I believe, uh, there's a bit of um, a bit of a misunderstanding, I guess, that people often find that they want to hire, for example, someone who's very, like a computer science uh, graduate uh, to be a product manager. That, you know, they believe is sort of a very core component of it. I would dispute that and say that actually a lot of good product managers that I've met out there don't even have computer science or tech uh, degrees. Um, product managers, first and foremost, like I said, are the advocate for the customer. So you'll find that people who are, for example, even like user researchers in background or have a psychology degree, uh, human center, human computer interaction, human center design uh, backgrounds, actually do fantastically well in the role. Um, and. But the most important part is actually understanding, you know, technology just enough so that you know what what technology to leverage at what time to, to get things done. Uh, so, you know, a, a, a product manager that understands that rewriting, you know, the back end of the product is going to take a long time and it's, you know, and nothing's going to get out the door, um, you know, and really understanding that the differences between, you know, a very quick UI change and a very significant back end change being able to converse with their engineers very effectively uh, on a high level and also on a, on a, on a low level um, is important. So they, they need to be able to be comfortable with technology and willing to sort of dive deep if they need to. But having a software engineering prerequisite, not particularly key, which is why key skills have been down software development-ish. And just ensure that the team always, always, always works on the most important thing at any given time. If there's one thing that the product manager needs to be able to do, it's this. Um, you are, as a product manager, if you don't accomplish this, you're wasting your team's time, your engineer's time, uh, you're wasting your company's time, you're wasting uh, time because when your customer receives uh, the goods, they're going to be like, why are you working on this when there are some other more important products, uh, more important features that I, I, you know, I need. Um, a product manager's role is to pull all of the feedback and data possible to ensure that every single thing that the, the 
the product team works on, that the engineers work on, are the most important. Um, how they do that, it's up for debate. Um, there are obviously different agile methodologies out there, whether you go with Scrum or whether you go with Kanban, I personally couldn't care less. Uh, but the ability to organize your team, the ability to say, hey, at any given time, these are the set of things that are the highest priority, uh, and why, is probably a very, very critical part of uh, problem management. And you know, I'm going to throw empathy in there again. It's the third time I've shown this on, on deck because I really think it's important. Empathy towards your team and understanding, uh, like, you know, understanding that every everyone really wants to work on the most important problem. And understanding that and having empathy towards uh, you know, if you're going to be asking your team to, to work, let's say, longer hours, why they're doing that, uh, and really finding a good way to express that is, is important. Part two. Um, so there's actually a fantastic article called Good PM versus Bad PM out there. Uh, this is not that. Uh, I just stole that title, but threw out a bunch of bullet points of what I believe are traits of a good PM and what are traits of a bad PM. Uh, bad PMs spend most of their time on internal matters, especially for big companies, it's very easy to do that. You just spend time on meetings, you just spend time on, on nitty gritty things that don't really matter. Um, good, bad PMs ship only when the product is right. They have this idea that, um, you know, now it's ready to go, but, in the, but otherwise they're just going to keep working at it. Just keep working at it. Bad PMs only think about high level problems. I've met too many PMs in my life that only care about strategy, they only care about like, the big picture but they aren't detailed enough to actually get to the execution of them. Bad PMs throw specs over the wall. They'll write something on Confluence, or write something in a Word doc, and PDF, email it out. Throw it over the wall, so the engineer, the uh, designer will deal with it later. And bad PMs focus on inputs and outputs, uh, and not necessarily on times. So I'm gonna contrast that with good PMs. Good PMs spend just as much time talking to internal stakeholders as they do with external stakeholders. So that's their customers, that's their partners, that's being out there validating with customers all the time. Good PMs balances getting it right versus getting it out the door. Um, you know, sometimes getting real world feedback is more valuable than just working and working and working towards a perfect solution, uh, which never exists. Um, they can straddle high level thinking with attention to detail. Um, you know, oftentimes a PM is also sort of the chief tester because they determine if a, a product is good enough to be released and they have the attention to detail to tell when something is off. Uh, and, and it bugs them. It bugs them when something, you know, is, is a little bit off. Uh, they have the attention to detail. Good PMs communicate for shared understanding. They care that, you know, whatever decision that gets made, gets made with a certain level of consensus. Uh, they care that people understand why they're doing what they're doing and they drive towards that shared understanding across the team, whether you're a designer or an engineer. And they're focused on outcomes and not outputs. Uh, they care that whatever they do affects the company's bottom line, affects the customers on a very deep level, uh, beyond just you know getting something on the board. And to the key question of when do I hire for product for the founders out here, um, one thing I would like to talk about, uh, it's, it's a, it's, if you talk to product managers out there, it's often a very sensitive topic. If you're hiring a product manager to be a project manager, you're going to have a very, 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 very bad time. Uh, if you recall the six pillars that I talked about before, pretty much none of those are project management skills, maybe like 0.5% of that is. Um, you know, hopefully I've demonstrated that product management is a lot more than that. There's the customer aspect, there's the business aspect, there's the design aspect. There are a lot, there's a lot of it that goes beyond just putting things on a Gantt chart and getting things out there. Uh, I've talked to many founders who, when they hire a project, product manager, really are looking for a project manager. They, they often, it often comes in this line. I have this great vision. Someone just needs to come in and execute it. If you're looking for that, you're not going to hire any good product managers out there because they're never going to um, so, when should you hire for a product manager? What does it mean as a founder to hire a product manager? If I were to summarize it in one phrase, it's shared custody of your baby. If you want to hire a product manager, you've got to give some of it up. In a startup, product equals a strategy. And if you're hiring a product manager to manage your product, you've got to recognize that they need to have skin in the game uh, to your, and have the ability to make decisions that affect your business, that affect your product, that affect your baby. So product managers can't work effectively unless they own the product. 
unless they can say, no, this is the most important thing that we can work on now and have the ability to make that call, you're going to have a bad time because no one would be interested in actually uh, taking on that role. And B, even if someone were interested, they wouldn't be very effective if they didn't have the autonomy to make that decision. So don't hire a product manager unless you're willing to let some of that go. And personally, I'm a big proponent of startup founders not hiring a product manager too early. You don't need it. As a startup founder, you should be the number one product manager. You should be out there talking to customers. You should be out there figuring out how the product ties into your business strategy. You should be out there pushing all six of those pillars constantly and iterating on those until you get to product market fit. So I believe that you don't, you should not hire a product manager unless you absolutely can't do pillars one to six effectively anymore. Maybe you don't have time. Maybe you're, you're busy you know, chasing the next round of funding and you really just want someone to take product to the next level. Uh, if it's that, you know, start considering it. But really don't make a knee-jerk reaction to hire a product, uh, a product manager, if all you want is someone to execute for you, because that's not the right time. Um, and know this, PMs are not strong in all pillars. So we talked about six, we talked about sort of different skill sets. PMs come in different shapes and sizes. Know what your company is lacking. Is your company lacking someone who understands data? Is your company lacking someone who has more UX flair? Is your company lacking someone who knows how to motivate a team and give the team purpose? Whatever that is, have an understanding of that. Um, and it ties into the next section that we're going to talk about, which is hiring your first PM and what that looks like. So if you have a good understanding of how you want to, how, you know, what you are looking for in a PM, this becomes a lot easier. And so what I'm going to show you now is our, our couple of interview tips about how you can interview PMs. So this is coming from the interviews that we used to do at Microsoft and also the interviews that we do at Trade Gecko um, about different types of questions that we ask uh, during an interview. <coughs> the first one is what I call a product design question. I absolutely love this one. Um, it's often done in a whiteboard setting. So you usually give the candidate a whiteboard marker. You work through a problem with them. So you start by giving them a relatively big design problem, like the one that we recently gave, I guess now that it's public, we can't really give it anymore, is design a doorknob. It's a vague enough problem, but it forces the candidate to ask questions. So what are you testing for? You're, you're testing for precision questioning. Yeah, you, you're testing if they know how to dig deep and actually ask you questions about, like, who am I designing for? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? What are the metrics I care about? They, you, they need to understand the user. They need to drill down and figure out who their user is. They need to prioritize and trade off, uh, trade off things. Should this door not have a digital pin? Should they, is, is that important? Should it be connected to the internet? Is that important? They, they need to make trade offs. They need to know what success looks like. And uh, the fifth one is very important. Always throw in some feedback. Give them a bit in a couple of curveball questions and see how well they respond to feedback. All of those things are critical, critical things that product managers need to be able to do. They need to know how to really drill down on who they're solving a the problem for, why, they need to trade things up, they need to know what success looks like, and they need to know how to respond to good feedback uh, from, from people uh, that are not just them. So, um, to very quickly summarize, when we say design a doorknob, the end state that we want our candidates to get to is we want to design a doorknob for an Airbnb host who wants, who wants their guests to be able to come in and out of the house when they check in and check out. So unless you're able to ask us those questions, you'll never get to the solution that we're looking for. So very important aspect of that. Analytics, um, someone who is data informed, someone who is data driven. Uh, one thing that you can do is, for example, have a product in mind, get the candidate to whiteboard a business opportunity with you. When I was interviewing at Trade Gecko, that's exactly what they made me do. Uh, they made me, you know, they said, you know, what if, you know, we were to introduce Uber to a new city? Can you estimate what the opportunity looks like and how you can go to market? Um, so if another example is, you know, what's a business model for a food delivery app in Singapore look like? Uh, who's it going to hit? You know, you want to you want to get them to start doing things like estimates, even if it's just back of the envelope calculations. You know, where they can, they can come up with this, a business model that works. How how do the, how do you make money as a as a product? And uh, you can also throw them a little bit of data. Let's say you have a pre-made spreadsheet of you know, different regions in Singapore and how often they order food delivery and uh, see if a product manager can come up with insights based on data that you give them. Past experiences, 
Um, especially for your first product hire, try to hire somebody who's done product before. Um, you can't afford to sort of have someone not have that experience, especially if you're trying to get them to meet a product team. So a question is very simple. Tell me about a product or feature that you've shipped. This one is really experiential. It's very similar to a lot of the uh, behavioral interviews that you've seen in the past. But really what you're trying to test for is, it's number two, but it's very important, what their practical product design methodology looks like. How do they lead a team? How do they make trade-offs? How do they bring customer feedback into the loop? Um, how do they deal with conflicts? Because conflict, without conflict, product managers will be out of a job. Uh, and prioritization and trade-offs. How do they do all of those things um, in a very effective workplace? How that comes together. And this is um, usually how I wrap up my interviews. Uh, what's your favorite product and why? And how would you improve it? By asking that, you really make the candidate think about um, what makes them tick in terms of their appreciation for good technology, their appreciation for good design, their appreciation for good product. <clears throat> and you get to dig deep about who's using it, why do they use it, um, and what is it. Right? You're digging about they're digging through their thought process for incremental improvements. Because if you're asking someone to come up with something from scratch, you know, you anything on the whiteboard is net net positive. But incremental improvements as product managers as we know, that's like eighty percent of your job. Um, and metrics for success. You know, if you have a successful product like let's say, you know, Uber, how do they what are their metrics what do you think their metrics of success are? Uh, and really and you know drilling a candidate on whether or not they can come up with uh, those good metrics. And the final section is scaling your product team. So how do you go from a team of, let's say, just you as a founder, to let's say one product manager, two product managers, three product managers, where, for example, now you have not just a core product, you also have a mobile product, and then you also have an API product um, that don't happen to sit on the same backlog anymore. So how do you effectively do that? Um, Personal philosophy that seems to be proven out by companies like Amazon, and if you look at Redmark today, as they said, they believe in this concept called a two pizza team. Uh, the belief that if you can't feed a team with two pizzas, they're getting too big. Uh, the belief is that small independent teams that own their metrics, that own their deliverables, that own their subject matter, their, their areas, are much more effective than having a behemoth of a product organization or a behemoth of a software engineering organization. Um, and when you have these sort of two pizza teams across the company, um, they can be also you know, sort of pulled out and morphed into something else when needed. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. As an example, these are three separate teams with three separate backlogs. You know, for example, the core team, the onboarding team, and the API team. They each have a product manager, but the backend team perhaps doesn't need a UX researcher, it doesn't need a designer, uh, but maybe needs more engineers. And the onboarding team, or you know, a smaller team that helps customers onboard within the first 30 days, maybe doesn't necessarily need um, a data analyst, but maybe needs an interaction designer to deal with uh, the nitty gritty parts of you know, the first 30 interactions uh, on your site. So my sort of proposition here is that flat, flexible teams uh, are the way to go when, you, when you're sort of scaling on your product team. Uh, try not to go with behemoth organizations with large hierarchy. Instead, have small deployable teams across the board uh, that can help you uh, execute against different uh, and very specific product priorities. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening to my talk on product management. And if you have any questions, hit me up. Um, wondering what the usual OKR or KKS set of metrics for product managers since their work can only be measured after the product is launched. Very good question. Um, so if you take a look at product manager KPIs or OKRs, they're almost always tied to the specific feature set of the product that we're on. So as an example, it might be an engagement. Uh, as an example, if your goal is to get um, you know, people to, uh, you know, you have a, you're, you're launching a feature um, and it's about making sure that people, let's say you're launching a push notification feature, if the hypothesis is that people will come back more to the app when you have push notifications, 
that's what you would, you would set as the fundamental uh, KPI. It's you know let's say you know monthly active users or daily active users, and seeing if that number number changes. Um, and so the other part two of this question is since the work can only be measured after the product is launched, ish. A, pro a good product manager knows how to break big chunks of work down into smaller deliverables that are that can be shipped often and iterated on. And if that's the case, you should be in no shortage of having metrics as you go or numbers as you go. It shouldn't be a six-month process before you get your first sort of gauge of whether a product feature is working or not. Uh, it should be it should be much earlier than that. Tech or non-tech product managers. Uh, hopefully I've addressed that a little bit. Um, so the, the point there I believe is tech, someone who's tech literate and someone who's you know able to jump in and understand tech, but they don't necessarily need to have like a computer science degree or a tech background. Is there an app? <laughs> um, is there a consensus of best practice in the PM world for determining which features to build, fix, or develop? Is the main determining factor most important revenue potential? Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, I, I believe that the answer to this is it depends, and it depends on your organizational priorities at, at, that, at that given time. As a product manager, the reality is that you have to, like this is, this is a daily struggle by the way. Uh, when you have, let's say, a backlog of bugs that customers have been asking for, how do you balance that against something shipping the next feature which you know will be a revenue driver? It's a balance. It really is. You know, one, one thing that we did at uh, our old team was, for example, have 20% of the team every sprint focus on what we call engineering excellence, which is just bug fixes, right? To constantly make sure that customers are happy and we clear that backlog of bugs. Uh, but at the same time, it's a product manager's role to, to ensure that all of that gets balanced. So they need to understand that for every bug that gets, that gets thrown out there, how important is it? How severe is it? Um, and sometimes it's really hard to peg a dollar figure to that, but it's a bit of a qualitative art uh, that needs to be developed over time. But a problem manager tries. They try to try to quantify it and bring it down to a metric if they absolutely can. What are your <laughs> top three favorite products apart from trade decks? <laughs> Good question. Um, I'm going to try to throw out some local ones, which I think are actually quite interesting. Um, Top three products I actually actively use. Carousel is one of them. Uh, I strongly believe that uh, if you've met the team, they're very, 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 very user focused uh, in their conception all the way to where they are today. Clearly solves a very important pain point. I have deep respect for that team and the product. Um, Grab is obviously you know not the first one to invent something like this, but they're doing some fantastic things in the region, trying to disrupt uh, the industry there, and obviously really. If you, if you think about sort of how they they were, uh, the conception of that, you know, with safety as, as a key thing, really understanding that that was the pain point that they were solving. Um, very, very, I really respect that. And a third product, uh, I guess that I use a lot on a day-to-day on -day basis as a product manager is uh, Periscope. Uh, you guys might not know this. So Periscope is a product that lets you write SQL code. Um, and execute it against your database and gives you really nice charts out of that. So it allows me as a product manager to very effectively showcase uh, insights about my product, uh, about features I'm working on to the company um, without having to sort of, you know, uh, graph it on itself. And how, how would you improve it? I guess I'll pick one. Uh, let's take a look at Carousel. Uh, I think Carousel has huge opportunity for monetization. It will be interesting to see how, you know, as a product, they have a lot of people who, for example, sell handmade goods, trinkets on there as well, how they could potentially make that uh, a platform, like, for example, something like Etsy, uh, to potentially monetize it. I don't know. Uh, but it would be something that I would just personally explain. Last question here. I agree the founder ought to be assume a PM role, but over time, you have to start outsourcing, relinquishing control. Yep, agreed. And assume more of a product owner role. What tips can you share to help make this transition smoother? I'll caveat and say that I've never uh, been a founder that had to do that. Um, but one big thing is, I believe that you want, when you hire a product manager, hire someone who shares, uh, not necessarily your six month or 12 month roadmap, but they share your mission. Yeah. They, share the, they, sh they share your passion for what problem you're solving for who, uh, whether it's food delivery, or whether it's you know, trying to bring 
healthcare to the you know the underprivileged in Singapore, whatever it is, they need to really, really buy into your mission. Uh, if they buy into your mission, you know that everything that they execute against should should really uh, gear back towards where your company is, is headed towards. And even though the product roadmap may look different from what you had in mind, as you relinquish that control, you know that it's still building towards that. So. Thank you for uh, all those online questions. That is my first time using that word. That word surprisingly well. Um, so I'll throw it to questions on the floor. Anyone? Yeah, hi. Thank you. Uh, this comes quite timely because I'm looking for either a director of project, uh, product strategy or director of product to 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 uh, you know to build a use case on the technology. Um, there isn't any formal university qualification, mm -hmm. and I don't know what to put in my JD. So I've asked my two director of R and D and technology and application. Uh, both of them PhD. I tell them why don't you tell me what do you think the product director should be, product <laughs> manager should be, and give me the JD and what the qualification yep. of that person. So exactly to come up with. Well, I think this person needs to know something a lot of technology. I say I'm building a fashion app. Um, so how do I put out JD to look for a yep. director product strategy, for example? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think the first place you should look, um, you can take a look at existing JDs out there. If you, if you look at product management JDs, they actually, for the most part, cover like the, the six key pillars that I've talked about here. If you're really looking for someone with that breadth of experience, um, but for your specific startup, think about what is non-negotiable. Does that person, you know, there, there's a reality that if you work for a startup that does, for example, uh, Docker, like Docker is a very deeply technical product uh, for, you know, containers, you need to hire someone who is more tech savvy, right? If your product is highly technical like that and you need to, you know, do that, then focus on that in your JD. But otherwise, you know, focus on people who have had that experience taking an idea, in your case, uh, from an R&D phase and a net, just technology phase to productizing it. Um, unless you have that experience, it's actually really hard to pull it off the scratch. Uh, because it's often easier to go from problem to a solution with a particular technology, much harder to go from a specific technology into a problem that you're trying to actually solve it and to product it. So someone with that kind of experience would be good. Hi, um, so I was the guy who asked about the question of really, you know, releasing control. Right? Uh, yeah. So the next question I have uh, to ask is, I've been experimenting with trying to instill the mindset of a product manager in every one of my develop, development team. Um, is that a, a good thing? You know, does it work all the time? Is that pros and cons? What's the story that? 100%. Um, like, if you remember the, one of the first slides that we showed, the product manager role is, is less important than someone to call the product manager, but the product manager philosophy should be, everyone should be able to grok some aspect of that. You know, uh, when your engineer comes back up and says, what's the data? to prove why should I be building this? What data do you have to say that I should be building this next? Or, hey, have we, how many customers have we interviewed about this particular feature that you're asking me to build? That's when you know that they really have uh, instilled and really understood the concepts of product management. And uh, it makes a much, much stronger team when the product manager is not the only one banging on the door. So um, one problem I have that is, some of my guys are starting to be a bit of smart asses. They come to me and say, so what data do you have that we should build this feature? And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> um, you face that problem as well, and how do you work on that? And that's actually, like, personally as a product manager, uh, and I trade Gecko is one of our values, it's strong opinion to weekly health. Um, you know, if someone does have a better argument, and more data, and better data to prove it to you, you know, you can see. And that, that I think, is the key to a successful product. For a startup, there's so much of pivot which keeps on happening. Yes. So, uh, how, how do you hire a product manager who can take it in the stride of that one? Then I have the second question after. Okay, so um, a good product manager should be a big part of deciding things like a pivot. Uh, if you're hiring a product manager at a startup, they should be knee deep in understanding why the product needs a pivot. It shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't be the one receiving the news, they should be part of making that decision. So, with that said, 
more importantly, it's a product manager's role to explain and to really, you know, from a user data perspective, share this with the rest of the people that they work with, whether it's designers or their engineers, why this pivot is necessary. Um, so, and when when sort of when you say take it in stride, I believe that that's what taking it in stride means uh, for pivots as a product manager. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So why would you call an actual customer over there rather than taking the Yeah. I mean that's a that's a good question. Obviously, uh, you know, hard to do on a, on a whim. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things that we're doing more actively at Trigger is actually inviting actual customers, and we did that for the first well, not really the first time, but the first real event. Well, let's say like 20 customers uh, into our office and really digging deep into their problems and their workflows. Uh, and uh, if you, if you as, a, as founders or as product managers have the opportunity to do that, do it. It's very interesting to see when you get a group of not just one person that, you're, that uses your product, but five or ten of them using the product, and they're like, yeah, yeah, I have that problem too, or no, actually, I don't do it the same way you do it. And you get to see that conversation, those, those dialogues between your customers. It's a very interesting experience. Any questions? It's so very shy. <laughs> okay, so I think that's it. Uh, can we give a round of applause for you? Again? All right. Um, yeah, I think thank you guys for coming down to today's um, founders meetup. Um, well, I would like to thank uh, NTUCU Startup for providing the venue for us. Thank you guys. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so do look forward to the next meetup that will be next month. Uh, more details on TechInAsia.com. Feel free to talk to any of the TechInAsia crew clustered around the area um, or you way over here in front. Alright, thank you guys. <laughs>